Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Underserved, the podcast for the rest of the tech industry. I'm your host, Andrew Jelina. With me in studio today is JP Beaudry, CTO of edX. JP, welcome to the show. Hi, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Glad to have you in. It's nice to see people in person again. Indeed. Great setup you've got here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what sparked your interest in technology way back in the day? You know, I was very fortunate that I have some awesome parents, high energy, educated parents. And when I was young, right after we moved onto the farm, so my parents were, like I said, high energy. And while they had a full-time job in education and social work, they bought this 40-acre farm where I've learned a lot of stuff. And when we reconvened indoors, they eventually procured a TRS-80, a so-called COCO-3 computer. Mm -hmm. And my first introduction there was to learn how to move the turtle using the basic computing language where you had to if I remember correctly, number every line of code so that you can then make references with the go-to statement. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember breaking things or have two adjacent lines and no number in between anymore. Indeed. That was tough. Did you end up coding all through high school? Not that much, actually. In high school, eventually, we upgraded the computer to a Macintosh SE, those little square boxes with little uh, gray color screens. And I'm a little ashamed to say that I mostly play games on it. Mm -hmm. I think the closest thing I came to programming on that computer was while playing an RPG game, realized that I could make copies of the data files on disk and reload different files with the characters, eventually like double and triple the money and the gold and the potions and so forth. And that worked well until I corrupted the game and then broke the entire thing. But that was a fun little machine. <laughs> Hacking games way back in the day. I had the Macintosh SE30, which was like the same thing, but with a 68030 math coprocessor which I thought was the coolest thing ever. And it was like the lowest machine that would run Infinity, which is a rendering program that some fellow UMass students had commercialized. I spent way too much time rendering stuff on that. That was fun. I can imagine. I remember somebody trying to explain to me the notion of HyperCard, and at that point in time, it just didn't sink in for me. But speaking of rendering, some of my friends down the street were two computers. They started with VIC-20s and Commodore 64s and eventually got into the Amiga brand of computers. Mm -hmm. And they ran a bunch of experiments with that, that I would shoulder surf with them, and watching them trying to get the 300 baud modem going across the street. But they also played with ray tracing software. And I remember at the time that rendering an image of ultimately relatively low resolution used to take all night on those computers. Yeah, one frame, bit by bit, pixel by pixel, just yeah. took forever. It's a labor of love for sure. Indeed. So then you go, you do your undergrad in Quebec, and I'll let you pronounce the university. Yeah, Sherbrooke University, my alma mater. Sherbrooke actually has two universities, but the University of Sherbrooke is only the bigger of the two, and I did my electrical engineering undergrad there. Very nice. I think you got your exposure to CAD drafting software while you were there as well? Yes. I've never been great with hand drawing. It's certainly not one of my strengths, and I was so glad that we were the, the first year, the 39th promotion to replace drawing tables with AutoCAD software. And I thought that was such a phenomenal piece of software that you could draw something in the program, would recognize the lines and do auto snapping to line and auto sizing and the likes, you know, for 3D drawing. I thought it was just so incredibly powerful. Yeah, Jim Martin from season three talked about it's so hard to have a good hand to be an architect or a draftsman and work with that. And he was similarly enthused to finally be able to have the computer help him. But if I remember correctly, we had two kinds of computers on campus. We had some labs with 286s and other labs with 486s. And I think that software only ran on the more powerful ones. Yeah, I don't doubt it. Did you do any coding while you were there? As part of the basic curriculum in EE back then, you did quite a bit of assembly. So learning about microcontrollers, right, as you build up your understanding from TTL, logic, circuits, analog, digital, and eventually microcontrollers. And then later on, we did some introduction to higher level languages using Pascal way back when. Mm -hmm. I don't believe they teach that anymore. They had a co-op program similar to Northeastern, right? Totally did. That's one of the strengths of Sherbrooke's program is in your four years over there, you do four internships of four months or some combinations of 16 months of internships. My first one was so much fun. I went to work for a company called Icon Technologies in Montreal. And at the time, they built the routers and switches on cards that you would insert into computers, right? So either ISA cards, 16 bits, or Visa Local Bus, the 32-bit cards. And 
this was at the beginning of the commercial internet when the TCP IP stack had not yet become the de facto standard. And so I was there as a system integrator and my job was to test various kinds of network stacks and network connections. So token ring, ethernet, WAN protocol, like X21s and the likes. And so kind of a funny anecdote, we used to have lots and lots of phones and computers in the lab to test these networks. And one weekend on a Friday night, somebody forgot to hang up one of the phones and let one of the test scripts run all weekend over a long distance line and racked up a $1,500 bill inadvertently by the time we caught the error on Monday and, and hung up the line. Oh, whoops. <laughs> whoops, indeed. <laughs> but these were the days of, I think, the last hurrah of the uh, IBM AS400 microcomputer or... Um, like a mini computer? Mini computer, there you yeah. go. And gateway computers, you know, with the cow spot livery. Yeah, I remember those coming out. Everyone was so perplexed, like, wait, I don't have to build my own computer anymore? Yes, indeed. These were the days of the OS2 operating system and Microsoft NT and you know, like the, these standards just hadn't been established just yet. It was definitely the Wild West. And speaking of West, I think your second co-op, you went very far west to Japan. Is that right? Yes, indeed. So after eight months in Montreal, so I ended up stretching my first internship into the second and after going back to college for a couple of semesters, then I got wind of this program where Canada and Japan had this business relationship where they would exchange interns with one another. And so in preparation, I took a couple of semesters of Japanese language and learning the fundamentals of the culture. And I received a job at NEC, the giant Japanese electronic conglomerate. And this was such a five-star internship, you have no idea. They housed us in this beautiful hotel-like dorm for employees. I had a great job in this skyscraper in downtown Tokyo, you know, 15 floors, about a thousand employees. And it was just like really super well organized. They had interns across the company. They would get us together on a periodic basis to visit local sites and to learn about the culture and to gain different experiences. And it was just a really a top-notch affair. On the personal front, very quickly, I realized that I was probably ill-equipped to be fully successful and to earn my keep. As someone who had some programming experience, but certainly not a very deep one, I remember on the first day I got my cube, I got my computer, and then I realized that this computer was some flavor of the Unix operating system. I think it might have been Solaris. And I had never touched a Unix computer before. And so I asked for some kind of documentation, and what they could find was a very thick 400-page book, and the first chapter was configuring your kernel. And so two hours later, of course, I had completely corrupted my kernel in my attempt to recompile it, and I had to ask for help. So Somebody somewhere found a Windows CD that I could put on my machine and install that so that I may make some progress. But my job over there as a system integrator was to configure and deploy a multicast IP network running on an ATM backbone so that the leaders in the company could distribute video conferencing to all the floors and all the offices at the same time. And then when you graduate, where do you end up working? I was very fortunate that I graduated at the peak of the internet bubble. And so the demand for technical talent was through the roof in North America, certainly. And I met a recruiter for the company Bay Networks. So I went to a job fair in Ottawa and they were there, they were represented and they were very, very high energy. And so within short order, like the next day, I was on the phone with the hiring manager. A day later, I received some overnight plane tickets. I could come down to the greater Boston area for an interview. I headed off with the team. Shortly after graduation, I packed all my belongings in my car and drove down from Sherbrooke to Billerica, technically, right, for the locals, <laughs> and, and went to work uh, for Bay Networks. And then what were you doing for those guys? Coding or? It eventually turned into coding, but the job itself was quality assurance. So Bay Networks was at the time in competition with Cisco Systems in the routing and switching market. And my job was to make sure that the protocol stacks were actually working. So for example... Again, on the ATM protocol language, you have different classes of quality of service. Things that limit the jitter, things that cap bandwidth, things that are best effort, and how do you prove that it's actually working? So I was scripting some software and testing tools that would validate that by sending different streams of traffic and then making sure that they would get routed, but also shaped correctly. And the thing that got me more and more into programming is that to do a good job of simulating the internet, you have to simulate lots and lots of internet clients, which is not so easy to do by hand if you're doing it on one or two applications per machine. So eventually you need to simulate, script, and automate. Okay. I think you went to a startup after that for a little bit. Arrowpoint? Yes. Bay Networks eventually got acquired by Nortel, 
And while that didn't change the company all that much in the greater Boston area, the startup bug was being caught by everyone. And I interviewed with a number of companies and Arrowpoint had such a dynamic, high energy team that it was just like impossible to resist. And so as a two-year veteran of the industry, I was actually the oldest in the quality assurance team over there at Arrowpoint. But talk about a life experience. These were the days where the company was growing by leaps and bounds. We were quickly overflowing the office. We had two and three people per cube. And very quickly, just a few months after I started, the company went public. And so I participated in the pre-IPO roadshow preparation. So I didn't do the demos, but I helped package the technical systems that would be demoed to various investors. You did some Perl programming there too, right? I certainly did. So there too, we had to simulate lots and lots of internet endpoints and Perl was the language that this company was using. And so my skills eventually improved in programming. At that point in time, I decided to go back to school on a part-time basis. So I did a master's degree in telecom, which is a combination of computer science and IP and the law and of the industry in telecommunications. And I ended up teaching Perl programming to the rest of my crew at Aeropoint. I was a big fan of CPAN back in the day. It was just amazing how many modules there were to do almost anything you wanted. It was incredible. And I remember learning about regular expressions and that blew my mind. And for a little while was following the regular expression poetry challenges that would come out every now and again, like how you could express English ideas in regular expressions or how you can solve problems in a form as compact as possible, which is, of course, absolutely not readable by humans. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, some people have accused Perl of being a write once, understand never again type of language. It's happened to me more than once that I would pull out an old script to, to refactor it and not remember what I had written. And I knew I'd written it and literally could not make heads or tails of it. That taught me how to comment software, though. You do have to comment the heck out of it. So then they were acquired by Cisco, right? Absolutely. There was another amazing part of the journey is shortly after becoming public, The company was acquired by Cisco and folded into a division that built uh, contact center products. So Aeropoint's claim to fame was a contact center load balancer, something that you would put in front of e-commerce servers, right? So again, this was the beginning of the commercial internet and all the dot-coms, you know, the dot-com booms. And so we ended up building a catalog of products that would load balance between servers and then at the DNS level, load balance between data centers. Big companies like Yahoo at the time, of course, wanted geographic distribution and load balancing. I know one of your roles, this is before like a black duck software existed or anything like that, was to figure out their exposure to open source and the licensing, right? Indeed. At that point in my career, I was a manager of a relatively substantial engineering team. And we had this piece of software that was quite successful in market, but also was relatively old. Some of the earliest files had been written 15, 18 years ago. And at some point, of course, we had to do our due diligence in making sure that we abided by all the terms of the various third-party pieces of software that we used. And we identified a couple of gaps, meaning things that we were unclear. And so we had to chase some licenses down. And for most of it, it was relatively straightforward. But for one specific software library, we could not find the author. We had the person's name, but no websites, no contact information, no nothing. Someday one of the engineers on the team found that person through Facebook. And that's how we were able to establish a contact and ask the person for the explicit terms and the permission to use the software, which he so graciously granted. So you had to track the guy down through Facebook Messenger, like, hey, can you give us a license? Yeah. (laughs) Wow. And so what are you driving at the time when you're at Cisco? Oh, when I was at Cisco, I was so fortunate. I splurged eventually on a gently used luxury German sports coupe. So I've always been into vehicles. And then as I got a little bit of money in my pocket, of course, getting vehicles that were a bit more reliable was a big priority of mine. Yeah, you can't be changing tires and getting towed everywhere. (laughs) Absolutely not. This was an interesting vehicle for me because as my corporate responsibilities expanded, you know, from a junior manager to senior manager and so forth, I also purchased my first house, which was a hundred year old property which needed a lot of TLC just to physically stay upright. And so I used to go to the Home Depot every weekend, sometimes multiple times a day to get materials and tools. And I would always get chuckles from the staff when I would load two by fours and PVC pipes and rugs and scaffold in this two-door coupe. But you'd be amazing. Like a half-inch pipe of PVC, you can fit a 10-foot length in the BMW 3 Series, two doors with the seats folded and from the footwell of the passenger to the back of the trunk. 
<laughs> so you don't even have to have the windows down? Nope. Oh, wow. So from Cisco, then you move on to Vistaprint? Yes. In my last several years at Cisco, I was extremely fortunate to work with a senior executive who was an agile transformation expert. And he had taught us new ways of working. And it dramatically transformed the business from the internal culture to what it felt like to work there, to the business outcomes, the quality of software, our ability to deliver value to customers, and all of that. And we ended up teaching it internally to other groups within Cisco, so much so that we eventually devised a bit of a playbook. So we became pretty good at explaining to people the trade-offs you got to make, the tough choices, what is likely to be relatively easy and relatively hard, and so forth. And eventually I got into contact with Vistaprint, who had similar desires. As Vistaprint had grown from a couple of hundred people to at that point, 4,000 people, they wanted to recover some of that startup energy and speed. Is there a way to reduce lead times when you're in a large organization that now has inherent complexities to it in various complex departments and value streams and so forth? And so I left my organization of 100 people behind at Cisco Systems to join Vistaprint as an individual contributor working for the C-suite and the CTO to find ways to transform the company into more agile ways. What was it like? Did you get resistance from folks while you were trying to do it? In hindsight, when I look at the amazing people that I've worked with at Vistaprint, they were amazingly willing to try new ways of working. When I look at the things that I was asking of them, the leaps of faith, that they were willing to take just based on my sometimes relatively flimsy arguments and lack of evidence. They were quite courageous, I should say. It sounds like they trusted you. They trusted in the process of experimentation, of discovering what works and discovering what fails. There are some things that we did that were smart. So for example, we applied Agile on the Agile transformation, meaning that we didn't set standards across the entire company. We started to identify a few pockets where we experimented and deployed these new ways of working. And once we experienced successes, of course, that increased our internal credit rating, if you would, and then that warranted larger experiments elsewhere. Yeah, I think that sort of iterative expansion with some early wins to show definitely helps build your credibility and, as you said, your internal credit score. There is no doubt that an internal champion who has skin in the game, who is convinced that these methods and culture and mindset are useful, is way, way more credible than an advisor, a coach, or a consultant that comes in from the outside with relatively less skin in the game. Yep. Hey, sport. How was school today? It was okay, Dad. How was work? Ugh. Actually, I had a rough day. Leading an engineering team is hard. I mean, I have to ship new software, meet deadlines, and tackle new projects while keeping my team focused on the day-to-day. It's hard to keep up. Jeepers, Dad. <laughs> Why don't you call Syrinx? They're the software engineering firm run by software developers. They helped Billy's dad. He used to be stressed out like you. He was missing deadlines, his team was overworked, and a bunch of folks left the company because it was too stressful. But then he called Syrinx. <laughs> And they put developers to work right away. He hit all his deadlines and freed up his team to do other work. His boss was so happy Billy's dad got some extra time off. Time off? Wow. What did he do with that? He spent it with Billy. That's a swell idea, son. I'll call Syrinx today. Now, you go wash up for supper. Now, did you get involved with DevOps there as well? Eventually, the Agile transformation was so deeply embedded in the company that we were able to dissolve the coaching team. In other words, the different departments took on for themselves these ways of working, be it HR modifying the promotion review board to product management, taking on cost of delay and story mapping and portfolio management to the senior engineering leadership making sure that we remain organized in cross-functional cells and we work iteratively and with fast feedback and we operate the software that we build. And so there came an opportunity for me to take over the entire technical operations function at Vistaprint that included functions like corporate networking. How do you wire 27 offices and make sure that everybody's connected at all times with fidelity, data center operations, source control management, SRE, enterprise application customizations to support different functions, say like contact center and customer support, things like that. 
Yeah, in a previous episode of Underserved, Jesse McSweeney said, if you do a really good job as an agile coach, you kind of work your way out of your job, that the groups learn to kind of fish on their own and adopt the methodology and you can sit back a little bit and let them run it. I think that has to be the explicit goal of every coach in a company. If you're constantly needed, it means you've become a crutch and you have not actually fully met your goal of transforming the ways of working for sure. Leading technical operations was really interesting for me because really early in my career, I had built these products. I had built the load balancers and DNS servers and routers and switches and application security software. And now all of a sudden I'm the user of it. I'm the one sitting and receiving the various phone calls by the vendors and evaluating technology and deploying it and cursing the bugs and the limitations and having to make some of the trade-offs. And so that was a nice sort of a 360 in that aspect of my career. So you end up having to eat your own dog food several years later. And I imagine you develop some empathy as a result of that. Absolutely. Also, I think by virtue of having worked in these departments, I could sort of set expectations with my teams into like the relative speed of getting our future requests acted upon. So at Vistaprint, do you trade in the coupe and get another car? Or? Yeah. So eventually this coupe, after you know, nearly 10 years and well over 100,000 miles, lived a good life. And it was time for me to look at something else. But I had been so satisfied that I bought essentially the same thing, just newer. So another coupe. But by that point in time, I had become fairly discerning. And so I wanted something very specific, like the right color, the right set of options. And I found the right car, but it was in Florida. So again, it was a gently used vehicle. I didn't want to pay top dollars for something brand new. And so I find this car in Florida. And the current owner is this awesome young man who's leaving the armed forces and he's a helicopter pilot and he was going to be working off the coast of Louisiana and didn't want to bring his car with him for XYZ reason. And so he sent me like a million pictures and super well documented. And so I bought the vehicle sight unseen. We organized transport and sure enough, the vehicle arrived. It was exactly as described. It was just like a beautiful experience. So if you're listening to this, Travis, thank you. I love the car. <laughs> Yeah, I had a somewhat similar story in 2008. I wasn't really aware how nasty the world was going to get for the next two years. It was like right at the beginning of the financial crisis. And I had been looking at these Shelby GT 500s for a year. And some dealer down in like Mobile, Alabama put it on eBay for a reasonable price. Most of them were selling for over MSRP. And I was like, wow, okay, I bid on it. I won it. And then I'm like, how do I get it up here? And it turns out you can get something trailered up for like six, eight hundred bucks to get it trailered up from the south. And it arrived one winter day <laughs> coming off the transport. It was pretty cool. I still have that car. It's for sale, by the way. Oh, very, very nice. Maybe I'll take a look. <laughs> but yeah, that vehicle was quite rare. It was super reliable as well. I only had really one incident with it. One winter, a pothole swallowed the wheel and took a chunk out of it. Like I'd take a chunk out of an Oreo cookie. And luckily, thanks to the run flat tires, despite the, the whatever 10 square inch of wheel missing, was able to limp back home. But then I realized that one of the headlights was loose and completely out of alignment and the adjustment mechanism wouldn't work anymore. So I went to the garage and they looked at it and it was like, well, to replace that, it's going to be $1,500. And so once I came to, <laughs> you know, and they got back to my feet, I was like, whoa, 1500 bucks for a headlight. And so I'm like, I'll take a crack at it. So one evening I jacked up the car, removed the wheel, removed the fender liner and looked inside. And three hours later with a bunch of little hand tools and bent pieces of metal, I realized that the headlight was held in a sort of three ball joint mechanism so that it could self-level. And one of them popped out of the socket. And I was able to find just the right kind of purchase on it to pull and pop it back in. So it cost me three hours, but zero dollars. Definitely made your money on that one. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, scrape knuckles and two beers is what it ultimately took. <laughs> so nowadays you're at edX. I think most of our listeners will be familiar, but if you could tell them a bit about edX and what you're up to there. Yeah, so I joined edX almost two years ago as the VP of engineering and nowadays CTO. So edX is the largest open source online learning platform in the world. We emerge as a collaboration between Harvard and MIT, and our mission is to reinvent online education. So we do so by dramatically expanding access to the best quality education. And we reimagine education, not just online, but also on campus. And one of our goals is to improve teaching and learning by enabling research. And so what edX does is a two-sided marketplace where we partner with the best universities and companies in the world to bring 
content, right? They're learning their courses from short courses to programs to certificates to full-blown degrees online. And we offer that to people around the world. And so nowadays on the edX platform, we have over 37 million learners on the edX.org, the website that my teams operate. And we also offer our source code to the world for free via an open source program. And we have well over 1,500 other installations of that software that is being used by people around the world. NGOs, governments, academies, K-12, and so forth, where people run their own courses. And so when you look at the global impact, it's well over 100 million learners that are impacted by the edX software. Wow. I didn't know that you guys licensed the software out to folks so that they could stand up their own learning platforms. That's cool. Yeah, you can go on GitHub and just get the open edX software. What's it written in? Well, nowadays, there's no single programming language, but the back end of the platform is written in Python and the front end, it's all modern React JavaScript. Yeah, very popular stack. So you can now do a entire master's degree online on edX? Yes, indeed. You can do a full master's degree online. So we have a number of university partners who have made that available the number of masters. And we also have this notion of micro masters, which can be a precursor to a master's degree. can be done completely online. It's the exact same degree that you would get if you were on campus. And so that dramatically increases access by people who sometimes cannot be on campus. It's also significantly less expensive. So it's typically something like 40% off the price of the on-campus experience. And so are you still driving the same very particularly designed coupe? No, I'm no longer driving that specific coupe. You know, as life circumstances continue to evolve, so do your vehicles, I think. So nowadays, I did a couple of firsts just in the before times, pre-pandemic. And so my entire life, I drove manual cars. And so now I did a couple of firsts. I bought my first SUV. It's obviously an automatic. And so that's a big change. But it turned out to be a fortuitous change. I bought the SUV because where I live now, we're at the bottom of hills. It's very hilly. To get out of the neighborhood, you got to go up relatively steep slopes. And one winter I discovered during a storm that we literally could not get out of our neighborhood with any of our vehicles. And so uh, I was like, okay, the next vehicle has to be all wheel drive for sure. That's despite running premium snow tires on the coupes. So having the SUV worked out for me because last fall the phone rang and this was the director of the ice hockey program that my daughter participates in. And They were looking for a head coach for the team. So the folks that had been earmarked could no longer participate on account of COVID and different changes in personal lives. And so I became sort of the last minute head coach of the U10 travel hockey team. One of the responsibilities of the head coach is to carry the equipment for the goaltender. (laughs) So the trunk space at the SUV became super useful to carry not only my daughter's equipment, my gear as the coach, but also the goaltender stuff. Oh, yeah, you're going to need an SUV to carry around goalie stuff. Yeah, it's huge, it's heavy, but it's worked out beautifully for us this winter. So we mentioned cars a few times. What was the kind of origin story to where you became an automotive hacker? Was it out of necessity way back in the day? It totally was out of necessity. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with vehicles. I think we started with hate, and now it's definitely love. I grew up in a fairly rural area. And to go anywhere, you needed a mode of transportation. So at 14, I got a moped. I got my driver's license at 16 on the dot. And as soon as I could afford it, I bought my first car. As you can imagine, on a $400 budget, it was a heavily used vehicle. So I found a 1986 Hyundai Pony. So that's a hatchback slash wagon, rear drive vehicle that I don't think was ever made available in the United States. And now, for those of you who remember the 80s and those kinds of cars, For some reason, they just rusted so quickly. By the time we got the 90s, the Japanese manufacturers had sufficiently affected the manufacturing processes in North America that all of a sudden vehicles became a step function more reliable. But that Hyundai was definitely from the before times. And so over the course of a couple of years uh, that I kept it, I had countless adventures with that vehicle that forced me to become quite proficient with wrenching on the car. Allow me to list a few. That vehicle required an incredible amount of crank time to just start. I'm talking like a minute, two minutes, three minutes, enough so that people would give me stares and tell me, hey, JP, you're going to burn something out on your vehicle. I'm like, yeah, but that's the only way that will start. Till the day where a gentleman told me about the points that would create the sparks. This was like a $1.72 piece you get from the Hyundai dealer that was completely life-changing for that vehicle. 
A friend of mine and I used to love to cross the border, the United States border, to come and get gas and Slurpees and whatnot. But one day in a typical Seinfeld episode, we pushed it a little far and ran out of gas. But we were between two hills on the highway. And so we're kind of stuck there. So we walked, got some gas, came back, drained the battery in trying to get it restarted because I was too silly to save a little bit of gas to put in the carburetor. And so I ran out of battery before the fuel pump was able to push the gas all the way there. And we had to bump start the car on the highway. So that was quite an adventure. At some point, I had an unfortunate incident with a deer with that vehicle. And the deer scampered away, but ended up smashing one of my headlights, not having the budget to purchase a new one. I had to rummage through a junkyard and eventually the only headlight that I could shake loose was from the driver's side, but the one that I needed was on the passenger side. So the only way that it would fit is that I installed it upside down so that the holes of the brackets would match. But the net implication was that when I would put the high beams on, I would get the high beams on the driver's side, but the passenger side would then point straight at the ground. So it was sort of winking at incoming drivers. That vehicle had a cable-based throttle and more than a few times as I was climbing a steep hill in Sherbrooke, coming back from the part-time work that I had, the throttle would stick wide open. And at the top of the hill, there was a very, very tight bend. And so that made it for a very exciting event there. So I learned to use the, the stick you carry in your car to scrape the snow in the morning during the winter. So I used to use that and whack the throttle under the hood to loosen it free. That car rusts so much. One day I'm driving a friend home, we go over train tracks, and then the shifter that looked like a tractor shifter, it was so tall and long, sort of kind of just like went through the floorboards and was just being held by the ball. And what happened is that the cross member that held the drive shaft to the back ripped through the floor pans because it was so rusty. And for the rest of the drive home, the bottom of the transmission would just like scrape on the ground all, all the way through. And then one day I opened the driver's door and then the window just kind of disappeared inside the door. Like you just like turned it super fast. And same thing there is like the bottom of the door just rusted and the whole assembly fell straight to the ground. And so that car at that point in time, had close to 200,000 miles on it and well past its prime, but the motor was doing great. So I bought the same vehicle that had a great body, but a blown motor. And so by virtue of having plenty of space on my parents' farm, with the help of several of my friends, we, we swapped the motors. And so that was a three-day adventure, but we were so proud of ourselves. We made it work. It was great. So Ben, Patrick, Jean-Marc, thank you so much for your help, guys. <laughs> this was life-changing for me. Well, now there's entire YouTube channels where people are doing what you guys were doing, making a Franken car out of two wrecked cars. There's a guy, Rich Rebuilds, that took a Tesla that had been flood damaged and another one that had like a working electrical system and put the two together. Drove it around everywhere, was all excited about it. Turns out you can get free supercharging because the car no longer communicated with the Borg anymore. So that's amazing. I think I've seen his YouTube channel. Yeah, they do some amazing work. I had the same stuff happen to me, though, way back in the day. I had a Volkswagen Quantum station wagon, and one day the window just sunk down into the door and wouldn't come back up. We had to hold it up in a suction cup. God, I don't miss that car. So many problems. Yeah, same. That first Hyundai went to its final resting place on the back of a flatbed. But the second one I ended up selling. And I couldn't believe the gentleman wanted to buy it. And I was like, are you sure? Because we were on the phone and he's like, does it run? I'm like, it runs. He's like, then I'll take it. I'm like, okay. But for 150 bucks, I think he got a pretty good deal. The car after that was a beautiful Isuzu iMark Turbo. So two-door hatchback, tinted windows, mag wheels. That thing was sharp. Really, really sharp. That's the vehicle that I drove to Boston. One thing you had to do back then when you took a Canadian vehicle to the United States is make sure that it passed all the laws and regulations for a vehicle. So I used to rent a place in nearby Lexington. So I had to drive down on Congress Street at, I forget which office, to get some kind of paperwork reviewed and getting a sticker. On my way to Boston, the clutch just went limp. And so what happened is the firewall and one of the grommets there popped out. And so the cable went loose. There was no tension left in the clutch cable. So I ended up having to drive to Boston and back without the clutch. And so the way this worked is at a stop, I would shut off the car, put in first gear. And then as I would turn the key, that would cause the car to lurch forward because the gear was already engaged. But luckily the battery was strong enough that I would start the car. And then after that, I would have to carefully rev match up and down. So it was quite the adventure. Oh, so you would slip it out of first and then rev it and then let it drop in the second? Yeah, exactly. So on the upshift, you got to be careful. In a downshift, you can blip the throttle to rev match. 
<laughs> You're lucky you didn't leave that transmission sit on <laughs> Storo Drive. <laughs> I was a little nervous with every stoplight. But then about a year into my employment at Bay Networks, eventually I, I felt I was making enough money now to buy something a bit more recent with less mileage. And so I would say this was my first adult car. So I got a, a one-year-old 1997 Acura Integra GSR, a beautiful white two-door coupe, five-speed stick. That thing was just phenomenal. I remember just giggling and laughing, leaving the dealership. This was such an adult vehicle. And that never gave me any mechanical troubles, except for one Friday morning, I come out of the place that I'm renting, right? Just to go to work, it's 8 a.m., eyes are a little blurry and stuff. And I look at my car, and I'm like, why is it sitting so low? And then eventually I realized that it's sitting on four blocks and the wheels are gone. So I had put some plus size wheels on this thing. And during the night, clearly somebody came in and stole my four wheels. And so I had to call into work and tell my boss, <laughs> essentially the equivalent of the dog ate my homework, <laughs> but I can't come in because my wheels are gone. He's like, who stole your car? I'm like, no, no, just the wheels. <laughs> <laughs> That's rough. What do you even do in that scenario? Do you get it flatbedded somewhere and put four new wheels on? So the first thing I did after having a cup of coffee, I called the Lexington police and I'm like, is that even the kind of thing you want to look into? I don't know. I'm just FYI, this happened. They actually sent a detective and he took the time to dust the vehicle just in case he could find some prints and there were none. I would say that the people who took the wheels were still kind that they took the time to actually put something under the jack points so that the car wasn't resting on the discs. And so I was pretty thankful for that. So it took me a few days to buy a new set of wheels and the tire rack was available at the time. And so uh, with the quick shipping, that turned out to be uh, relatively straightforward, if a bit expensive. Did they take the lug nuts? They did take the lug nuts. (sighs) So JP, thank you very much for coming down today. We enjoyed hearing your stories and having you featured on Underserved. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And we'll talk to everyone soon on the next episode of Underserved.